The final chapter will be comparing counts. What do we mean by counts? What are we comparing? Well, we're comparing groups right here to see how often things occur using what is called the chi-squared test of independence. And we've done things like this previously, where we've looked at a contingency table. Now, a contingency table is the bivariate combination of two categorical variables, which will be key. We need two categorical variables to make a contingency table. And oftentimes, we display this with a mosaic plot. So this is the contingency table, and this is the mosaic plot. You can actually tell super quick that of the people who were alive on the Titanic, more were in first class. Of the people who were dead on the Titanic, more were in the crew. The contingency table lets us look at the counts of observations, hence we can compare the counts. Now, counts doesn't make it quantitative data because you'd have to ask the questions categorically. Were you in the crew? third, second, or first class. That's categories. Was the person dead or alive? That's categories. We have inside of here a cell. We are specifically looking at comparing conditional distributions to see if someone was in the crew, would they be more or less likely to be alive or dead, or if they were in first or second class, or if they were alive, were they more likely to be in the first, second, third class or crew? Now, what I really like about this idea is it's really easy to write the null alternative. To write the null alternative, we will not use statistical notation. We will simply look at the x and the y variable and add the word independent. Remember what test you're doing. You're doing the chi-squared test of independence. So class is independent of survival. That's all we need to do right here. The null hypothesis will be class is independent of survival, and the alternative will be class is not independent of survival. Well, what does that mean? It would mean that your class was associated with your survival, because if it's not independent, class would influence in some way someone surviving the Titanic. At least right here looking at this, it looks like there's evidence of that, that class is somehow not independent. But do we have enough evidence? And the way to look at it just visually is the more separation there is, the more evidence. If everything lined up perfectly, all the groups were perfectly flat across, then Whichever level of x we are on would not influence level y or be associated with. So the bigger these gaps over here, these gaps right here I'm talking about between the conditional distributions, because within one and the other, the bigger the gaps, the more evidence there is. But let's get a statistical way of quantifying this. Before doing any of this, we need to know if we are able to do this. We need to check our conditions. As we like to say here, condition one is random. We need to randomly collect this data. Well, if the Titanic is a random collection of passengers who went on a ship and random people who would select first and second, third class and crew, sure, maybe we pass that. 10%, less than 10% of all people who would go on cruises, sure, maybe we pass that. A lot of people gone on cruises. These are the first two conditions we use for all tests and intervals in this class. We have to pause right here and now ask what kind of data we're doing. This is where we change things up a little bit. The next condition is going to be a new one, expected cell count. It's kind of like how we used to do success failure, where you need at least 10 successes, at least 10 failures. But now since we have two variables, two categorical variables, well then we could say, let's just cut it in half. Five is good, some statisticians use higher, but you need at least five expected cell counts. We're going to show in just a little bit how to calculate these expected cell counts, but when we calculate them, there needs to be at least five. And a trick is to check the smallest one if the smallest expected cell count is greater than five. It's like if you go out with your friends and you all need to be over 21, if the youngest friend is 23, you're good, you're all over 21. So we could check the smallest expected cell count and see if just the lowest one is greater than five, because if the smallest one's greater than five, we're all good. Now the last condition right here is going to be count data. And I know it came first, because it's actually kind of the gateway. I always like doing condition one as random, condition two as 10%, and then think about the different conditions. Count data means that both variables are categorical. You are not doing the chi-square test of independence if both variables are not categorical. So if you see mosaic plots, if you see contingency tables, you have two categorical variables, and thus you can do the chi-square test of independence on the data. As long as your data was collected randomly, you have less than 10%, and you have at least five expected cell counts. And I like to say, even though we did it first, 
that you have conditioned for is count data. But what are these expected cell counts? After we check our four conditions, expected cell counts are going to be how many individuals we would expect in a certain group. Here's the formula, but it's a lot easier than you think. Let's go look at a table right here. This table is going to be people who are adults versus college students. And we are going to ask them, are you in shape, let's say. So we're going to say in shape or out of shape. We talk to 100 people. 50 of them are in shape. 50 of them are out of shape. 50 are adults. 50 are college students. So when you look at this right here, like what is an adult? I will just say someone over the age of 40. I guess I'm an adult then, right? Someone over the age of 40 who is not in college. So a college student is anybody in college as the operational definition. Adult is a person over the age of 40 who is not in college because uh, you, you're still kind of an adult, but we're going to call you a college student. If you're in college, you could, you could be 90 and you'd be a college student. Sure, you're a college student then. You're 90, you're in college. Operational definitions are used. So how many adults would you expect to be in shape? Well, here's the thing. You take row total, which would be for, well, first, how many in shape? So row total in shape, and then we do column total, and then we do grand total. The way I like to do this is circle where it intersects. So we would expect 50 times 50 over 100, which is 25. And what's interesting, this is actually the multiplication rule. Because when you do multiplication, you assume independence. You're actually doing 50 over 100 times 50 over 100. And that would give you 25%. And then this is why you then multiply by 100. Which if you go back to the previous formula, that would actually cancel out one of your divide by 100. There you can see the formula. Row total times column total over grand total. You can memorize the formula or write it down. I like to then, as I show right here, show where things intersect. And everything would actually be 25 for all this. This is just what we expect. Because if half of people are adults and half of people are in shape, well, there's 50 adults. I expect half of them to be in shape. You could change the numbers on this example and say a lot of people are in shape. Let's give people credit, right? So now if we have here a different number over here, and we have a lot of people in shape, 90 people are in shape, and 10 people are out of shape, we have 50 adults still and 50 here, well now it'd be 45, and we'll show how that's calculated. The change to the numbers, we're gonna take row total times column total over grand total. So the row total is 90, the column total is 50, found by just going across here and across here to say how many adults do we expect to be in shape, times it out, and you will get 45 right there. It's basically half of 90 when you think about it mathematically. It's like, well, half of people are in adults, many people are in shape, so I expect about half, about half adults right there. You can keep changing the numbers and keep working with it. These are some simpler ways to think about it and understand the equation with the numbers we are using, with the row total, column total, and the grand total, circling your numbers is really key to solving it if we ask you what is an expected count for a certain group right here. And so now we need to calculate if there is a difference and how big that difference is. We have what we expected and we have what we observed. Maybe we only saw three adults in shape. The observed is what is in the cell. All of these here are observed, they are not expected. To calculate an expected for one of these, like first class alive, we would need to do the formula 324 times 712 over this. Hence, you can draw your formula there, and that would give the expected for the cell where it intersects on that. Notice how this would calculate mathematically the expected first class alive. What you view here in the cell is the observed. We saw on the Titanic 201 people survived. And mathematically, we can calculate how many we would expect given this data if it is independent. And so this only gets us a difference. Any sort of difference we have in statistics needs to be standardized. Now we take these differences and we actually square them. 
The reason we square them is to make the differences positive. And once we have what the difference is, we need to standardize that difference. One of my favorite things to talk about and why we standardize this is if I tell you something costs $10 more, is that a lot? Well, a candy bar, that's ridiculous. Because maybe you observe a candy bar costing $11, and you would expect it to cost $1. But if you take versus what you expected right here and take the square of this, you can see that this is 100 over 1. But what about if we talk about houses? Now, I know houses have been going up in prices, but if you say, I expect this house to cost, let's say, $400,000, and the house costs $400,010, that's the same difference that we saw in the above equation. And so we take the expected right here of 400,000. You can tell since you're dividing by a much bigger number that this difference of 10 is actually very tiny. So the bottom part of this, the dividing by the expected, gives us context. Because when is a difference large? It depends on what we're talking about. A difference of $10 in a cost of a candy, candy bar is like, what's the deal with that candy bar? A difference of $10 in the cost of a house is virtually nothing. That would turn out to a very, very small difference. Now, if you notice, we do have observed and expected for every single cell, because every single uh, cell is an observed for each of these. And then it would also have an expected. So we don't just have one difference to standardize, we have a difference for every single cell. And we have to go through here and calculate the quantity of the observed minus expected squared to make it positive, divided by the expected to standardize it, and sum those up to get what is called the chi-squared test statistic. Not chi, but chi-squared. And with this, the chi-squared is a bit like the T because it has degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom are rows minus 1 times columns minus 1. This, once again, is an easier formula to memorize. We'll show how to memorize it here in a second, but notice that the chi-squared actually becomes more like the normal with higher degrees of freedom. A lot of things approach the normal. And the degrees of freedom determine the shape, like the T is determined in its shape by the degrees of freedom. A chi-squared with 1 is very right-skewed, versus chi-squared with higher degrees of freedom is more normal. But how do we use this formula, rows minus 1 times column minus 1? Well, if you look at the original contingency table, we look at how many rows it has. Rows are how many options there are for survival. Two. Classes are four. So do this. This is a two by four. Now reduce your fingers to one and three. One, to, one times three is three. We'll look at more of these coming up, but there's two rows. Four columns, minus one, multiply on both of them. And so another way to do it is to just delete out one row and one column. If you delete one row out of this and one column, delete, delete, you will see three on the inside. Now don't use the totals. I've seen people make that error, and there's the three degrees of freedom. So there are three degrees of freedom, and that tells us what chi-squared distribution we are using. So we need to know then how to do the test. Well, the chi-squared is always going to be a positive number because it's squared. And when we draw on the curve, we will always do the greater than test. The larger the chi-squared is, the smaller the p-value. The smaller the chi-squared is, the larger the p-value. The chi-squared is inversely related to p-value. So we need to see if the chi-squared is large enough for us to reject the null. And we'll do this using applets. The most important thing to enter into the applet is going to be the degrees of freedom to start. Make sure to go to your applet and immediately enter in the degrees of freedom right here. This would have had to come from a two by two test, as in there were two rows and two columns, minus one, minus one, one times one, one degree of freedom. From there, we can find out the chi-squared and enter in it to find the p-value. So let's look at some examples of this with cars. Here is a 2 by 3. So since it's a 2 by 3, this chi-squared will have, think about it, 2 degrees of freedom. 2, 3, reduce, reduce, 2 times 1, 2 degrees of freedom. And once again, just to show, there's 2 rows and 3 columns. Act 1 from each and multiply. Or, if you want, delete, delete, 
And you will get, after deleting one row and one column, the two cells, which are the degrees of freedom. Now we need to write the null alternative. We have type of car and maintenance. Remember, we just say x is independent of y, x is not independent of y. So type of car is independent of the maintenance we get, or maintenance is independent of type of car. An alternative, maintenance is not independent of type of car. Like if you know what type of car someone has, it would influence or give you information about the maintenance they get on their car. Doing this by hand takes a while. We would have to go in here and after looking at all the counts, find all the expected values. So the value you see right here of 48.18 is found by row total times column total over grand total. Remember, you just trace across to the values and solve out for the expected value. And you'd have to find them for every single one. After finding all of the expecteds, you take all the expecteds and you go and find all the chi-squareds. So the chi-squareds are going to be, here's that expected we just saw a moment ago, and here's the observed, which is the real data, what we see, divided by the expected, they're different squared, and you get a cell chi-squared. Now you take the cell chi-squareds, every one of them, for kind of how weird is each cell, and you sum up the cell chi-squareds to get the chi-squared test statistic known as the Pearson chi-squared. This is Pearson who created this Pearson chi-squared test statistic. After getting the Pearson chi-squared test statistic, you plot it to find the p-value. That's because the Pearson chi-squared test statistic is a lot like a t or a z. Very important to know that it's a test statistic, a standardized difference. So we can go right here, and there are four, or excuse me, two degrees of freedom. Remember, three by two, two times one. And we can then take the test statistic right here, the chi-squared, and we see a p-value of 0.0045. So remember, I reject the null hypothesis that maintenance and car type are independent because my p-value of 0.0045 is below my alpha of 0.05. I have evidence for my alternative that maintenance and car type are in some way associated, i.e. not independent. This can be shown to you in jump output right here with the chi-squared test statistic, also with the p-value over here underneath the Pearson. Degrees of freedom can also be shown. How does this look visually? Well, we want to look at it to see if there is a relationship. And it looks to me like Toyota is the ones getting regular maintenance more often. That's a really weird one. It's like, well, Toyota, a lot more regular maintenance only for Toyotas, where the other ones, Chevy and Ford, have more regular and unexpected. And we can go across the uh, column totals right here, or row totals, to find out the percentages where this is a very unlikely amount. Remember we said the bigger the gaps, the stronger the relationship. The p-value lets us know if this difference is statistically significant. Now, if we had only had this data inside of here, my guess is that difference would not be statistically significant, meaning differences between Chevy and Ford, uh, Chevrolet and Ford, might be by random chance. Although there's a small difference, that small difference is likely by random chance. I didn't run the results, but visually speaking, it looks like that's a small difference. How about Swedish men and prostate cancer? Well, we'd need to check that this is Random data. Did we randomly collect Swedish men? If we did, good. Is it less than 10% of all Swedish men? Well, I think there's probably a lot of Swedish men, including PewDiePie. 62,720 Swedish men, as long as there's that many, we've sampled less than 10% of all Swedish men. Next, we have to have that the expected cell counts are at least five. Well, with that, we can check the smallest, and the smallest expected cell count would be here, here. We need to do 466 times 124 over 6272. And that's the expected cell count for never seldom, yes, got prostate cancer. And if that's greater than 5, we are good. That's how we check the expected cell count. Remember, row total times column total over grand total. So where they cross in on each other, circle those numbers, and that will give you the mathematics for the uh, expected cell count for that cell. We can also get this, these numbers from jump very quickly by cl clicking the red arrows and seeing the expecteds. Now a trick is that the expecteds must add up here to the total. This is where the expecteds are. Look at that. You can actually do some tricks right there knowing, and you see one, that's about 115 and that's about 9. So 115 and 9 would add to 124. So if there's ever blanks right here, you could simply take this value and subtract here. 
Now that's not the mathematics that creates it. This value right here is going to be row total times column total over grand total. The mathematics for that value would be this right here, 466 times 2978 over 6272. The other value that is blanked out currently on this screen is a cell chi-squared. This is the third one. That is going to be the formula, the observed minus the expected difference squared over the expected. And the observed is the count, because that's how many we saw. This is count data. And then the expected is right there. That is the formula from the famous Mendel P plants, observe minus expected quantity squared to make it positive and over E to standardize it. That is a cell chi-squared. Summing up the cell chi-squared gives the Pearson chi-squared test statistic. So if you took all these cell chi-squareds right here, which are here, 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 and looked a lot of them are small. We got, um, that one might be, it's still pretty small. That one would be small, 2.4, a lot of them are decimals. If you add them all up, you would get this value right here, 3.677. You then need to go to the curve. How many degrees of freedom does it have? Well, this is a four, because there's four groups right here. By two, do not use the totals. Four time, by two is three times one, which is three degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom for this, which is gonna show us the respective chi-squared curve, we would plot this out and draw it and see what we get. But here's the thing, the differences look small. I want you, if you're following along, to go to the chi-squared with degrees of freedom equal to three. Go ahead and put in a chi-squared on the right-tailed test, which is what we do. You'll see a curve, something like this, and you'll shade to the right of it on the chi-squared equal to 3.677. Find out what the p-value is. You can do things like this. You understand that a larger chi-squared leads to a smaller p-value. At this point, especially looking at the likelihood ratio test, which is not the one we're using, but the p-values should be pretty similar between them. They're mechanically similar. You can see we would not reject the null. So let's just assume for a moment that the p-value is this one, which is not. What would we say? Well, I fail to reject the null hypothesis because my p-value is 0.3414, which is above my alpha of 0.05. The null hypothesis that I failed to reject, because I didn't tell you what it was, is that... Uh, the prostate cancer and fish consumption of Swedish men are independent. I do not reject that. My p-value is way high. And with that, we do not have evidence for the alternative that there is some sort of association between these. You can look at the graph visually, too, to see that there's only small minor differences that are likely by random chance, given there is no association. That made sense. You understand some statistics. Great job on this journey in statistics.